I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. Somebody once described art to me as a bouquet of complexity. If you're just doing one thing, it's not as interesting to me. What I liked about Pryor is he would let go of the laugh and go into something that was sad and then ultimately funny, but it was sad. And so that's always where I wanted to go. I think it's that valley where you're going from peak into the valley to another peak. But that's what life is. What do you mean that's what life is? You're always sad at some point in life. And there are entertainers that go on. It is just about the jokes. It is a disembodied experience for me. And some of them make it an art form. They do it really well and I can enjoy it for a bit. It's just not my voice. My voice has got to acknowledge the fucking loneliness and sadness associated with the reason I had to get the comedy in the first place. (laughs) Producing an experience that is worth having. And I think that's where you start to border from, let's say comedy or anything into artistry. Yeah. You're creating an experience with the audience. Yeah. And that is unique and individual. It's like a canvas yeah. you're painting on. And yeah. so what does that mean? Because that's going to be unique to every audience. So I'm so excited to have Dove Davidoff. Yes. Comedian, actor, author of the book Road Dog, Life and Reflections from the Road as a Stand-Up Comic. Dove, you're also on the show Shades of Blue. Yeah. You're on HBO's Crashing. Yeah. You do real estate. You've been all you've been all over the world as stand-up. I want to describe one story from the first evening we met. Uh, we went up to Gotham Comedy Club together. Yes. And Seinfeld had performed right before you. He was the, gu- right. the guy on right before you. I mean, we, I, we even saw him leave with like his bodyguards. And then you had to yeah. go on. Sure. So my first question is, Knowing that Steinfeld had just gone on and the audience in their heads, they're just, th- all they're thinking is, I just saw Jerry Seinfeld. I just saw Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. How do you kind of like go in as a performer Separate it. and break their mental break or emotional thing. connection with what they just saw? Yeah. If you're a musician and you're following Michael Jackson, that kind of thing, the, um, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't experience it as that hard. You just try to acknowledge whatever's going on and let it dissipate or- organically. That energy that, that just, was brought into the room. It's not that he's so funny that it's challenging to follow him. They're trying to get around their idea. He's an icon. He's an icon. You know, that kind of thing. Right. They, they're having a New York experience. They're having a New York experience. Rather than like necessarily. It's an emotional lingering thing, you know, and it's, uh, it's almost like seeing something. It's like there's an elephant in the room. You just acknowledge the elephant and then you make sure you have your own energy. You don't jump up and try to do material into the wake the wake is that thing behind the boat. And if you if you just if you follow that boat too closely, so to speak, you're gonna just travel in whatever kind of rut it's left behind it. Uh, I don't know if I'm describing this well, but if no, you but, separate but, the moment, give it a little bit of time and space, 
and then bring your own energy and thing. The rest of it, um, it'll follow. They'll come around. You know? Yeah. Well, I I think I think the first thing you said was really important, which is that you have to. You, you said you just have to. I don't think it's that simple for people. To right. Realize. It's not that simple. You you have you have to acknowledge that Seinfeld was there. Yes. And you did that in in the first few minutes of your yes. act. You were like, oh, did Seinfeld? Mm. Yeah. There was some kind of a musical stand. It's like a music stand. And like, yeah. Did, did Seinfeld put his notes here, his and you jokes, like move yeah. the stand to the side, like almost like physically removing yes, that's his right. presence yes. from the stage. Yes. So I don't know if that's like instinctive or planned, or you're, that's instinctive. You, you work with the tools in front of you. Whatever is there. If he had a stool there, it's a, did he sit here and it moved the stool? We're, we're getting out of the way. Let's 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 all move on with our lives now. And you're going to see something just as funny but different and and then, and then you're you start off with like a, i wouldn't even call them like standard stand-up comedy jokes you just had a lot of energy yeah. addressing you know current events in a funny way yeah. and then you switch to more kind of standard right. jokes you had some donald trump stuff you had, yeah you had, you had jokes then yeah but that was by, probably by then the seinfeld uh, everybody's settled that energy dissipates it's like when the music changes if you're watching i don't know I, I guess if you were watching a band and then another band comes on there's usually the reason i think an mc has traditionally been a part of a show is that it creates a a, a before and after a, a sort of an interstitial is that is yeah. that a word um it's like if even if there's a good act, regardless of whether or not Seinfeld or anybody else, if there's somebody who was really funny and you you feel that rhythm in the room, some people don't even like to watch any a, a, other comics that have a specific type of rhythm. You can watch how other con there are comedians who will adopt that rhythm too closely. There were a bunch of Richard P Pryor clones, um, and there have been clones of lots of people. But I mean, um. If, if you can, you got to maintain your own voice. And oftentimes, if an MC brings me up right away after a middle act, if I'm headlining on the road, um, if the middle act is done really well, I won't just jump up and try to do jokes because it's a different kind of music, you know? So if we just all acknowledge that there is something that the music, so to speak, is changing, um, then we can relax into whatever the new voice is, provided that the new voice then comes and brings it. I won't hang around just chit-chatting because then the crowd's going to drift. People are going to begin talking to one another. I'll do something that will galvanize or draw their attention. And then once people have settled in a bit, I'll do something that is funny. Ideally, it's spontaneous. If it's a joke, that's okay too. Um, so let's say let's say you're 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 on the road and and uh, uh, we're gonna get into a lot of topics, but this this yeah. one particular because of the Seinfeld thing um, intrigued me. Um, let's say you're on the road, the the you're the headliner, the guy right before you kills it, like he's just hilariously yeah. funny, right. great jokes. Right. How's you in? And you like the fact that the energy of the crowd is high, but you still yeah. want to bring your own. You don't want to just. Um, live off of the energy of the last comic no, you want no. to bring your own so what would you yeah. what would you be thinking as you're approaching the stage what would you what would I would you do? use something whatever is in front of me to separate that there was a thing that just happened that you guys all experience and now that thing is changing mm. so I might even just get up sometimes there's a musical interlude when you go and work the village underground the comedy cellar there's a they're really good musicians that play the acts up and then there's a point during the show where they just play music for a, a couple of minutes and the music's really good and it's catchy. And then if you have to get up and follow that right away, just acknowledge the idea. Like sometimes I'll just say, I'd rather be listening to that music right now than having to do stand up. And people laugh because there's a certain tension there. There are a couple of giggles. There's a little bit of tension, but then it dissipates and it creates space between the music and the rhythm that everybody was experiencing and what it's going to transition into. And without that, you're just trying to match the energy of a thing that existed before you and it never works for whoever's on you know it's it's like it's and especially doesn't work it, there are people for whom it might work if it's a really high energy act that's really physical but if you have your own kind of voice you, you need to separate what they just experienced whether it's a musical act and i've followed bands or it's seinfeld or just another funny dude well okay now let's let's take it to Another thing, you know, when yeah. let's say you're auditioning for a part in a TV show or a movie, sure, yeah. um, you want to break the energy of whatever happened between the guy who auditioned right before you and you. 
Had it's already in kind of broken in that scenario. The door is closed. They know someone else is coming in. It's not an audience that's really operating on some emotional level. You might walk in, say hi. You know, um, there's usually some introductory kind of thing that goes on when you walk in. That's done for you for the most part. The stage can be tricky because you have to have the confidence to let that energy go. You, you almost have to throw a wet blanket on it. You know, they're all there. Sometimes, mean, like, how do you do that? Well, for instance, the MC will go, hey, yeah, and they're whipping the crowd into a frenzy, and the music is up, and then you jump up. My voice is to start out slow. I, I want to bring people down so that we can go up from there. I don't want to start up so that I have to match some inorganic pitch. That's interesting because most, I would, I, I you can't say most, but yeah. a lot of comics take the reverse approach where yeah. they just go out and say, you know, yeah, everybody yeah. keep it up. Uh, yeah. you know, they want the energy to keep going. Yeah, I don't. And, 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 um, although you are a high energy comic, I will get into energy, but it's gotta be organic. I'm not going to try to match oftentimes like Artie, he's a, he's a black MC. He, he comes from those rooms. Artie Fuqua. Artie Fuqua. He'll come up and he does it. He's a lot of energy up front and, that's fine. It's good for the crowd, but it doesn't help me. And so I, I, it helps bring the show together and get the crowd back involved. But then it's my job to sort of, it's almost like, um, I've said this before. I've heard Chris Rock say it. I had never heard him say it before I said it, but I just said, lower your expectations initially. Um, because you, you can't match that. There's no, we haven't, we haven't gotten to know one another yet in the crowd, right? The audience is there. And a few of them may know me, but a lot of them don't. And even if they did, like, I'm going to start out by, at some point, I want to talk to people. I don't want to match energy. And, um, and so you just got to create space so that you can have your own experience, you know? And it's, uh, otherwise it doesn't serve what I'm trying to do. It does, just doesn't work to jump on for me. There are, maybe there are people that do, but usually I find it's not. I've followed everybody. You know, whether it's Chris Rock or Seinfeld, I, I, I don't think twice about it. It doesn't bother me to follow anybody in the world. But well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you I'm gonna ask you more about this, but I wanna I wanna get to the book. I we've known each other somewhat for, for a while and and but I learned about you from uh, a lot about you in the book. You grew up mm. uh in a your parents, I guess, divorced early on. I'll or, explain it real quick. Yeah. My father was an uneducated Jewish business guy from the Bronx. My mother was a uh, hippie wasp analyst kind of intellectual from uh, california totally different yeah polar opposites and she was on her way to india to teach piano when she stopped off to meet her friend who was this uh, lesbian woman who owned a monkey and they were she the, owned a monkey yeah monkey so the monkey owner was renting this shitty little house for my father in, in, in a rural part of jersey um anyway that's how they met and, oh, and my mother was wrapped up on a commune, and my father ran a, a junkyard. Right, so you kind of half grew up like on a junkyard. And no, half no, ninety five percent on a junkyard, and then five percent as 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 a relative part of my mother's cult. I would go to the place where they built earth integrated housing. My mother spent a lot of her money on freeze dried food, awaiting the inevitable nuclear apocalypse. Um, and so, the hard part probably wouldn't even have been the cult life. That makes sense if you're in it. If you're in it and you believe that shit and everybody else you know is in it and believes that stuff, I, you can ride with that for a while. The problem was the dissonance. The problem was growing up around oftentimes violent working class kids in Jersey in a junkyard. I don't exaggerate when I say like, I, I, that junkyard isn't a euphemism. It was a literal I, junkyard. I, I feel like it, the only example of a junkyard I can think of, of course, is Sanford and Son, the TV show yeah. from the 70s. Yeah, you know, the junkyard. Right. What does it even mean? Like, what is a, a junkyard? A few acres <laughs> of crushed cars, metal parts. You'd be in the metal shipping business. You'd clean radiators to get the, the, uh, the, you'd try to get as much aluminum as you could because aluminum was worth more than steel. And so you, I buy a car from you or you drop it off. You got a piece of junk. You don't want it at your house. You say, can you come get this out of my front yard? And I come in and these are the demographic you work with. It's often poor people, people that work on their own motors. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, w when you work, um, somebody once asked this Dick Gregory, I think why, um, why he cursed so much in his act. 
And he said, because my life has been profane. And it's kind of, um, it's a profane environment. It's, it's, um, yeah, you described all survival. the characters in the junkyard. Yeah, yeah. Plus, kind of how the other kids were treating you as the sure. kid who grew up at a junkyard. Yes. And so it's almost like, and, and you describe it in this, in, in the book, like comedy almost becomes this self defense mechanism. Yeah. To, to, sort of deal with all the situation, deal with your, your dad who was somewhat, uh, yeah, my father was gay. My father was banging guys and my, f and, but my mother knew about it and, and he, he didn't seem gay. And I never, I mean, gay wasn't not even, you know, in the air at that time. Like that was not okay. You know, you were not in the village. And you wouldn't expect that, even though this is a stereotype, you wouldn't expect a, a kind of, um, almost gangsterish sounding yeah. junkyard owning yeah. Jewish guy right, right, right. to yeah. be, be, have that other lifestyle well that's why it was plus also he had a kid. fucking odd two kids also two kids. odd yeah that's what makes it genuinely kind of odd you know everybody it, it, thinks their situation was odd this was this was really high, very odd well well it gets it gets even more odd your your mom obviously was in this cult but yeah. then sadly i'm gonna just bring it up your dad yeah, yeah. you bring it up in the book your dad died of aids yes um when did he die of aids did he died of aids i was about 21 when he died, I don't know when he got it. He hid it for a long time, and then told me that um, that that uh, you know I was pressing him. He was complaining, uh, complaining about shit. You know, his back, his fucking head, or whatever. And uh, uh, and so finally he said, "Listen, the doctor told me two years ago that I had about two years to live, but that was two years ago when he left." And then he finally, you know, he said, "I'm dying, but uh, you know, don't tell anybody. You can't tell your mother. You can't tell your brother." And um, why didn't you want to tell your brother? He didn't want to distract him, and I and I was. He wanted to distract you. Well, I was more confrontational about what are you complaining about all the time, you know. And my my brother was away at school. My brother was living in Rhode Island at the time. That's what it was, mm -hmm. and so I was back and forth from the East Village. I lived in the Lower East Side since I was about seventeen, and so um, yeah, yeah, it was very um strange. I don't know. I mean, how did you how did you feel once you once you heard that he had AIDS? Was that the well, it wasn't AIDS. He just said he was dying. He wasn't. He he didn't get into it, and I wasn't going to push. I could tell it was uncomfortable, and they weren't clear. Nobody dies of AIDS. They die of a manifestation of AIDS. So then you put the when my mother met my father, he was banging. Uh, he, he had fuck guys or something, and she knew it. But her big problem with him was that he ate too much sugar, and, and that he was angry. You know, and she never really identified the the not being fully heterosexual as a potential problem in the relationship like a fucking wacko you know and um that kind of thing yeah it was odd and and did when he said he was dying did you know he was gay yeah. no no I, I i didn't know and also i didn't ask you know my mother had mentioned something i didn't i i was i was a real um a sort of a street ish Jersey, you know, that point in my life, I was around a relatively rough crew. And so it's, that's not something that I would have wanted to confront. And it, and he was never open with any of that, but, but, you know, having communicated with my mother, you knew it was going on in the background and it wasn't the kind of environment, of course, where you could be openly gay. I mean, he was the boss of, it was a rough environment. So, and, and, you know, once, once you did fully find out and accept was it yeah before he died or was it after he died well no no it, no he he died before uh he died um i never really accepted it I, or, or i don't know i mean we could do another hour on what acceptance means but I, I i just understood i just accepted the idea that i love him regardless and that he did what he did and he is who he is and um when you say when you say you love him regardless yeah of course, yeah. You know, if you love someone, it doesn't matter straight, gay, whatever. But also, in many ways, he was kind of emotionally abusive to you as well. Uh, at least as it's described yeah. in the book. I mean, sometimes you're saying it sort of humorously. But yeah, yeah. Humor, of course, is a way of uh, telling yeah. the truth in sure, an right. odd sort of way. Yeah. Uh, you know, you would say he was always yelling at you, but that was right. his way of communicating. Right. Yeah, that's how he communicated, and and and. Um, that's how his people, his parents, commun I mean, his father, he didn't really have a mother. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was in that kind of environment though. It never felt like abuse. Be you know why? Because, well. But sometimes, you know, there's Stockholm syndrome. Like sometimes the person subject to abuse 
Um, doesn't and recognize. It, right, doesn't yeah. recognize that and even ends up loving the person abusing them. Absolutely. It's a bit, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I would compare it more like uh, Sebastian Younger wrote that book, Tribal, and he talks about PTSD rates in Israel relative to the United States. And the returning GIs in the States report PTSD symptoms at a vastly higher rate than than the people that have seen conflict, the GIs over in Israel. Uh, and they've seen more conflict as a percentage of the population. But because everybody was in the military at one point or another in Israel, um, the PTSD arguably isn't necessarily created by the bomb that goes off as much as it is by the inability to communicate your experience when you come home in that you're left alone with that experience when you return to the United States. You're around a bunch of other people that probably haven't been to Iraq. Whereas, uh, so yeah, I mean, the whole environment yelled at everybody. And so I never experienced it necessarily as that. What did that do on a subconscious level? I, I'm not aware of that. Certainly, I now have trouble communicating with my wife because I can be overly direct and overly assertive, you know, because it's like prison, you know, I'm, when, when, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's kind of funny. Uh, well, the idea that I'm saying, yeah, I remember this guy got stabbed in a documentary who was stabbed over a um, can of soda. And the interviewer said, you stabbed that guy over a can of soda. And he said, it's not over the soda. If I allow him to take that from me without reprisal, He'll take something from me every day. And so um, when you grow up in that kind of environment that I did, I, I'm sort of, well, I mean, not so much now. I'm 44 years old, but, but back in the day, it could get pretty violent pretty quick because I had to let people know that, that you weren't going to take advantage of me. You, know? you can either sort of retreat or you almost become a kind of, uh, not so much the aggressor. I, I, I never fucked with people. Um, I was always sensitive like that, but, um, but maybe a way you, you fought yeah. was by developing this sense yeah. of humor and this comedy. I mean, you you mentioned instances yes. in school where your sense of humor just comes out. Yes. Almost I didn't a, know what it was. Yeah. Right. And you didn't know whether yeah. you were being sensitive or insensitive. You were just being funny. And yes. that became like this defense mechanism. Yes. And, yes. and I wonder if, I mean, I mean, Jerry Seinfeld, just to use him as an example, again, he always says he didn't really have a troubled background. He had a very right. loving right. middle class family. That's right. And um, but you often hear from comedians that their their comedy really comes from this deep source of, of yeah. conflict from from it's childhood. Probably and why so on. I never connected with Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, his material I can acknowledge that it's very funny. It's not the thing that I would probably turn on for an hour. Although I don't watch much stand up or turn it on. But when Pryor talked about growing up in a whorehouse and those experiences, for me. They were much more resonant than the Seinfeld, you well, know. Well, Pryor is interesting, and I'm going to compare that to um, so to HBO's TV show yeah. Crashing. Yeah. So you're on Crashing. It's produced by Judd Apatow, starring mm -hmm. Pete Holmes, but you play a pretty significant role in it. Yeah. And um, uh, Pryor was kind of your your standard run of the mill. I don't know what this even means, 60s comedian. And then suddenly he started. He was doing unquote, Cosby until he found himself. Right. right. And even Cosby was doing pre Cosby Probably. until he yeah. found his voice. And, uh, yeah. and, and yeah, prior suddenly set, started telling the truth. He started dressing yeah. how he would dress and talking yeah. about the whorehouse yeah. and talking about um, the condition of, yeah. you know, black people. And, yes. and, and, and he became the best comedian of, yeah. arguably all time yeah. and i on crashing there's this great scene which i really think is the the pivotal scene of the series where pete so you're running um a comedy club yeah, you're playing right. a comedy club owner which is right. for anyone who wants to know crashing trivia is the the grizzly pair in in um, yeah, the village right. and uh and by the way i've performed there it's yeah there club. you go yeah so uh and uh uh Pete Holmes is is sort of working for you. He's a barker. He's handing That's out right. uh, pamphlets. Hey, check out this comedy club. And in exchange, he gets a few minutes of time. That's right. And his parents come and visit one time. Right. And he tells kind of like, the show is kind of his arc as a growing comedian. And it shows him t telling his sort of kind of plain vanilla jokes that are, okay, they're jokes. Yeah. And his, his mom, his parents don't really laugh. But his mom, and then you go on and you tell the crudest, most insane yeah, right, jokes. Right, right, and of course, right. it's all scripted then, but I feel it really right. is. You're playing yourself. Like you're, I, I've seen you do stand up. I, I feel like that was your, your stand up. And the, the mom says, you know, Pete Holmes' mom says to him, you know, like Pete says, why did you 
like him. He was so crude and not right. me. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I was yeah. a while ago. Right. And um, the mom says, well, you were just telling these jokes and he's really he's really having problems. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I don't remember the exact I'm I never saw the episode, yeah. Yeah, and, and he, yeah. he's he's having problems and kind of showing it through his comments. Right, right, right. She, she had her own way of saying, he's telling the truth and that's right, what seeing. I see. Like, his I despair see. is like coming off right, of him. Right, right, um, Which is the way I've also heard Louis right. C.K. described as opposed to Seinfeld, like his despair is just sort yeah. of coming off of him. Yeah, And that's what I really get from your comedy. And so I think, I think that does separate out, as it's explained in Crashing, the professional from the amateur who's sort of rising up. Yeah, maybe. I, well, certainly, the, you, it, some people call it a voice, right? And I think what you're describing is a voice becomes integrated when you found some angle or perspective that feels organic to your to you, right? So, Louis talking about his kids, and he, he's not doing. He's not trying to parrot uh, an observational comic. If he has an observation, he'll make it funny. But like when Seinfeld, when uh, Pryor starts talking about having grown up in a, in a whorehouse, um, yeah, you experience that as as a, a part of um, his real or unique perspective. Um, what am I trying to say? The idea is um, you can have a guy that talks about their pain and growing up in the hood and whatever it was, and they can still be hack, really, really hacky. It's about the way you do it. You know, there are plenty of acts. I've, I've worked, um, you know, any number of rooms, somebody that's talking about whatever it is. If it's, if it's on in the, in the hood, they call it the chitlin circuit. Black guys will work around these, these often these black rooms. And, I've, and, um, you can tell it, sometimes there's just hacky and not hacky even if they're being honest about what does it mean hacky because I've, I've heard the phrase but i want to know how you define hacky versus not hacky like let's take an extreme knock knock jokes is not told are not told by stand-up comedians on the no, stage <laughs> but nobody tells them right so that that would be beyond hack that would be something else hacky is doing very derivative stuff it's like um there is a script it's almost like a rapper that gets up and without putting his own spin on something He's just like, it's another line about cocaine and, you know, violence. And like, you're a fucking hack after a while. If you don't do your own experience of that or put your own spin on it in some way, it, every it's just so d derivative. It's, but but, but, but look, look, this is always interesting to me because this comes up in, in every part of life, really. So let's say- Every part of life, there's you, a hack. Let's say yes. you're going into a yes. uh, a sales meeting. And, and yeah. I mentioned before, you also do real estate. You've been in, obviously, many business meetings. Yeah. Or any context. If you're scared beforehand, people often give this advice. Oh, just be you. But that's not that easy no, to do. No, that doesn't no. even really mean anything. Be authentic. That doesn't really mean anything. So no. so So what do you mean? And, and, it, and it really comes through in- your comedy that somehow you are being you but what does right. that mean like how do you cultivate yeah, the, those that are voice? good questions how do you cultivate that voice but just by doing it enough and then when you have enough confidence to not get a laugh which is hard then, that is hard yeah you're going up there to get people yeah. to laugh and often you're yeah. saying what you want but people won't laugh yeah it's the paradox like you gotta be okay with um failing a little bit to find a richer vein so to speak you know it's like you gotta the gold the good stuff is in really specific things that can at first be challenging to communicate um the reason why seinfeld's stuff is is good comedy is because um i think he's taken that observational thing that he does one he's the first guy to really get known with that style so to speak he identified his own voice and he's very good at the minutia and describing it and that's really a lot of what he thinks about i would imagine i mean i i don't i don't know him personally but i know people that do you know it's like um and so it's honest to him you know if i talked about that it would be a hacky version of what he's doing mm. um whereas for me comedy was more about reconciling my strange existence so um, I, I have to, so I would be more drawn to somebody like Louis material or, or, you know, it's like, and also Seinfeld, you know, my childhood had more violence and more profanity and it was a much di more difficult place to be than Jerry Seinfeld's but childhood. You know, it's funny though, because you don't, 
you don't, for instance, I'm sure you have a lot of great, funny stories yes. about growing up, but you don't necessarily tell those in your I don't have many. They all are so sad to me and <laughs> on some level. So they're not funny. They're stories, but they're not necessarily... I mean, you tell the stories in your book. Some of them are ironic. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm trying to write more from that place, but I haven't identified many. I, I've doing, I'm doing some material now about my father and... You know, shit about couples therapy. I mean, anything can be funny if told right, but I don't have a ton of, I don't think I've ever mentioned, I, I don't have a joke about the junkyard. I don't have a joke about my grandfather. And these were deeply funny places and people, but. Why do you think, why do you think just, and again, um, in this search for authenticity, it yeah. doesn't necessarily mean take yesterday and talk about it today in a funny way. Right. Um, it, it sort of means what's going on even at a deeper level inside of yeah. you. Like right now, everything that happened to you when you were 13 at the junkyard yeah. kind of comes out in this, um, you know, this happens in the book and I've also seen it in your standup, let's say in this kind of weird, uh, I don't want to say, use the word anger, but like you have a lot of uh, yeah. tension with your wife. Oh and yeah. I, I yeah. remember seeing you doing standup. You're like trashing her on stage and she's yeah. just standing right there yeah. laughing like she realizes it's a joke it's a well, comedy it's fucking club. true yeah you know and and i don't think of it as trashing i think of it as telling the truth and that truth may may or may not be a little bit challenging to hear but if i'm being honest then 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 that's the truth and whether what happens after that you know the other person's gonna have to live with i mean i'm not going to set out to embarrass anybody but if it's the kind of truth that is genuinely funny, I mean, like that's the bar in all this shit, right? So you can't talk about rape. You can't talk about this. You can't, uh, you know, talk about race from the perspective of, you know, it's like you can talk about anything. You can talk about anything if you can make it funny. And if you can make it funny, it means when I say funny, if it's thoughtful, you, if you're approaching it from a number of angles, if I want to make fun of black culture, I'm not really allowed to do that unless I approach it from a, more of a 360 type of perspective you know it's like if it's clear that i'm not looking to attack somebody then i can if i'm not you know if i'm not looking to impugn somebody's character then i can talk about my experiences whether or not they may be a bit a bit uh i don't know difficult to hear or, or or something like that when i talk about my mother i call it right war wrong battle the idea that she married this guy who was fucking guys in this strange environment but her problem with my father was that he ate too much sugar it's a paradox that though it may be painful for her to hear on some level it i, I can't not talk about it right because it seems like it's fucking crazy Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I hope you enjoy what I've been doing. I don't ask for a lot, but please take a moment to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you get your podcasts. It will only take you a second, but it will help other people discover the podcast. And my goal is to share this great content with as many people as possible. To see the show notes, just head on over to jamesaltucher.com slash podcast. While you are there, you can join my free insiders list to get notified when I post a new podcast. Once again, thanks so much for joining me on the journey of this podcast. You make jokes about what bothers you. And yeah. so that bothers you that there's right. this dissonance between the reality and how she approached it. And my yeah. guess is you've you've probably tried to confront her on it at some point yeah. and there's been some kind of no. either denial or whatever. Oh, oh no, no, there over. hasn't been a denial. And I have confronted her and she laughs at it because it's her truth. And um, I had a therapist that said, listen, you guys are never gonna, you see the world so differently. You must alter your ex expectation. Or you're always going to be met with some sadness or, or disconnect. Right. Or, so you alter your expectation yeah. of how your mother could could think and feel. Yeah. But you're able to take it out on stage. Yeah. That this is what bothers you. Yeah. And I see the same thing that you do with your wife, both in the book. Yeah. And on the stage. It's a reconciliation. It's a right, cathartic. Right. Like thing. you're kind of bringing together how how what you think is rational with what they are doing as irrational. Yes. But you can't explain it to them. Yes. And you and you make a joke out of it. Yeah, and the audience agrees with me. They're both irrational. <laughs> but but I yeah. would say watching you is that um is that 
maybe you're angrier than you think you are. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, like, like maybe. You know, because because you yeah. know, obviously nobody knows what what is going on between the sheets, no matter what yeah. you read in a book or what right. I hear from you guys. But uh, it's not always the case that she's no got, got this mental problem. No, it's and, not. And I'm I'm in this fucking couples therapy. That part is that, that's where some of my best recent material has come from. All of these I message stuff, the the interpersonal kind of styles we lapse into, and are, it's so challenging to to get out of them or to see them from the inside. And um, yeah, and I'm learning to access more of the the sadness and the fear that I have associated with um, my own core insecurities. The, like you learn growing up in the environment I did, you learn to mask them really, really well. It's a lot it, like jail. <laughs> you know, you don't, you can't show that you feel things because that will be taken advantage of. And so through, I'm learning to show more of that. And I have to because I, if I don't, my the art form won't evolve, and that would be very sad. What do you mean the art form won't evolve? Uh, it, it, because to bring the whole truth, you have to be able to explore your own fragility, your own sadness, your own. Um, otherwise, then otherwise you're just an entertainer. You're just a guy that can go up and make people laugh. But that's never what I wanted to do, you know. Um, like that's, yeah, it's like um if you can get into your own sadness and vulnerability, especially for me, that because it's a hard place to go. If your reflexive thing is to, Dan Adam is one of my favorite comedians. If your reflexive thing is to talk about your fragility, if that's what you're comfortable talking about, you know, Woody Allen makes fun of himself. It's that whole, you know, um, nebbishy kind of, but for me, it's challenging because I wasn't not like that at all. So for me to, to communicate a kind of vulnerability is um it makes it more whole it makes it more human somebody once described art to me as a bouquet of complexity and um you know if you're just doing one thing it's not as interesting to me but if it's complex what i liked about prior is he would let go of the laugh and go into something that was sad and then ultimately funny but it was sad um and you know and so that that's always where i wanted to go I, I think I think it's that it's that valley where you're going from peak into yeah. the valley to another peak. But that's what life is. Yeah. So yeah. so so okay. What do you mean? That's what life is. Well, because you're always sad at some point in life, and then the, I mean those highs and lows. Whereas a real, there are entertainers that go on. It is just about the jokes. It is a disembodied experience for me, and some of them make it an art form, and it's really they do it really well and I can enjoy it for a bit. It's just not my voice. My voice has got to acknowledge the fucking loneliness and sadness associated with the reason I had to get into comedy in the first place. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you do, you write from where you write from. Like you try to identify some, um, whatever your soul, whatever the fuck that word means, you know, has got to, um, otherwise how do you create art you know i mean you, you, you're trying to that like like uh yeah i i don't know I, yeah that's 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 the thing and and i think again that that otherwise uh, you're doing it for money and that's okay too you know but um there's got to be something something else you know i i used to work on wall street when i was 20 years old if i wanted to just do something for money there's a much cleaner path to money than stand-up comedy yeah, that, that that's definitely for sure. Yeah. Um. And but but you have actually kind of you know taken stand up comedy and as you should explore yeah. all the outlets of where it could take you. So for instance, yes. you're a regular on Shades of Blue. Yeah, so I play on a drama, which is very rare for a comedian to be able to 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 book a part on a prime time drama, a real drama with with uh, you know movie stars and all all that with Jennifer and, and Ray Liotta and those guys like. The, there are lots of people that on Broadway I had to beat out lots of guys from The Sopranos, lots of Broadway people. It's like, um, and how do you, how do you, how did you beat them out? Like I was just, just they just wanted me lessons. in the audition. Yeah, but I'm good at it because I'm, I'm good at acting. What, what's the skill of acting? I don't know. I don't know what there the is skill, a skill is. There. Oh, there's absolutely a skill. Most of it is you have to listen. I mean, if you want to do it well, you have to know why you're talking, what you want from the other person. And then you have to listen intently because that will determine whether or not you're plastic or not. If you're really listening and really feeling 
as opposed to trying to hit some punchline or doing your own idea of how that character would look in that way, in that scene, it's just gonna, you're not going to sell. You're not going to sell it. It's the one thing the human animal really is good at is, is sort of picking up on what is genuine, what isn't. So if something's a bad performance, people can feel that. Uh, you know, and it's like, so good acting is, uh, I don't know, it's a fucking broad, broad question. You know, James Lipton, what, what would he say? You know, the actor studio guy, yeah. that fucking, that puff, whatever he is. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just hard. The, what I like that I, I had done is that um, if you're not really famous as a stand-up, it's particularly challenging to go and get a dramatic part on a, in, a, in a movie or a television show um, because a lot of stand-ups just aren't very good at it. But the ones that are, I think, have real trouble with the crossover, you know. There aren't many examples, I don't think, right? Where, well, I'm thinking... Um, who's done well, well, Jerry Seinfeld and Seinfeld and Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm. But they're playing in comedy. Right. Okay, so let's say Dan Soder and Billions. Yeah, that's not a real drama. You have to be more st substantial role. Um, you, you, you'll, you'll find there aren't many. There's improv guys like Steve Carroll. Movie star before they gave him anything serious. Mm. If you have to be really famous before you got the serious thing, it doesn't mean you're not good. You can be brilliant. Steve Carroll's brilliant at, 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 at drama. But you didn't go in and win the part when you weren't. Right. You know what I mean? Like Jim Carrey's done drama. <clears throat> but he was Jim Carrey before anybody let him near a uh, a dramatic in a dramatic scenario. You know? I guess I wouldn't know though who was a dramatic actor if they, if they started off as a dramatic actor, but they were a stand up right before. Then I wouldn't know because I would know them as a dramatic actor. Or or you would have heard that some stand up like Judah Friedlander's had a couple of part. Like sometimes yeah. you hear that they were stand ups and then they were doing this other thing that wasn't comedic. You know, like um, ooh, the guy that was a stand up in um. And uh, he plays a cop, you know, on CS, like Belzer, somebody like oh, that. Yeah, Every yeah. now and then right. there are, you know, it's just, anyway, it's, I don't know that it's an important point as much as it is. I like to explore other things. My dream has never been just, you know, 100% um, stand up, any one thing. I mean, stand up is the thing that is more self deterministic. So in, in the entertainment business, the idea of doing something as an actor is you're a part of a number of pieces. You're a cog, so to speak, uh, and you, the only thing you have control over is your performance. If you're an auteur, and like Louis, if you're going to write it and shoot it and perform it, that's more attractive to me. But I don't love writing things, and I, and I'm not. I don't have that kind of talent where I want to, you know, work on screenplays and really break stories. And I've done my own show several times. I mean, I've had development deals and I've worked with really, real quality, well-known showrunners. But um, I don't. Uh, I don't love. Um, I, you know, I like acting and I like stand up because it's more self deterministic. But the process in Los Angeles of going out, developing an idea, pitching that idea to a network executive, then the network executive tells you whether or not they're going to buy your pitch, meaning they'll pay you to write that thing. So now you get X amount of money to write it if your pitch was successful, and then. Uh, they they give you notes and then you rewrite it and then that process goes on for sometimes six months, sometimes more. And then they'll determine whether or not they want to shoot the script that they've bought. Uh, if they don't, it's gone at that point. And if they do, then you shoot a pilot. Then you wait for that pilot for the network to determine whether or not they want to pick it up. And then if they pick up that pilot, meaning they'll order an episode order, they'll order eight, 10, 12 episodes. Then if they order it, um, the chances are you're not going to make it to the second season. I don't care about those odds. I believe in myself. I'm not worried about the odds. I just know that unless you love that process, the likelihood of that show becoming successful is so thin. And then even if it does become successful, the likelihood that it had, you know, that they couldn't have replaced almost any actor is, you know, they replace people all the time. And you don't... You don't have control over any of this. Whereas a stand-up, you do. It's just you. It's, it's your voice. I wrote everything that I said. You know, I, I performed it. I wrote it. I, you know, St stand-up seems like such a pure art it is. form in the it sense is. that you're on there on the stage. You're sort of naked on the stage. That's there, it. And it's the purest. Th and it's and it's visceral in that people are either going to laugh or they're not. They're not going to kind of like 
Uh, there's no cut. There's no edit. There's no we're going to do this again. And there's no listening politely and then telling you later. Nobody oh, you gives were a good. fuck. Yeah. Nobody gives a fuck. No. Yeah. So 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 it seems like a, a real pure art form in that sense, and an it incredibly is. difficult skill to to build up. Like yeah. how long have you been doing it? Oh, a long time. Man. The first time I did, it, I was 21 and 44. So the, I, for 23 years, though, less diligently early on. I mean, I was on a TV show in Los Angeles early on, and. Uh, I was doing a show with Jeff Goldblum, and um, I played a cop again. And then um, you play cops a lot. A cop or a criminal or somebody from the wrong side of the tracks. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you want somebody that seems like, you know, they run a sort of the sales side of a, you know, high end golfing resort or something. You know, it's not going to be me. You're going to choose. So, yeah, but it's. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, although the cop I play on Shades of Blue, he's like, at least he was, he was a Rhodes Scholar then then got back into being a cop for this other reason. So I got to play with the, he's a smart guy. But yeah, it, it, it um. Well, let's, how did you get involved with uh, Crashing? Because cr Crashing's pr produced by Judd Apatow and yeah. who's, who's basically one of the, the best kind yeah. of comic artist creatives out there yeah judd has really identified his voice he's that voice he's that guy although it seems like he he has a, he's his voice is expanding like crashing's different than the 40 year old virgin you know he Not has really. this whole kind no. of no no you don't think fundamentally no it's uh, it's a right. real super vulnerable guy who can't go out into the world and do certain things and um even in comedian he was he took that guy and just made him rich and famous and the loneliness associated with that but it's usually he's, he's tracking a, a really vulnerable not physical um kind of psychology i think right freaks yeah, and I guess, geeks i everything. guess that's right and then and then there's a, a a buddy aspect to his movies he's not doing scorsese material right he's doing a specific type of guy but, who follows. But, uh, there's a buddy aspect to his movies but i guess in crashing the yeah. the, the buddy aspect happens kind of almost episode by episode yeah, there's yeah Lang, exactly. and there's tj yeah. miller and sarah silverman yeah. uh you yeah. to an extent yeah. that's more of a conflict relationship but you still sort of have mutual respect yeah. for each other um, so how did you, did he approach you? Like, that's a no, pretty Judd, big deal. I, I met, you know, I know Judd from the clubs, but I don't, uh, I went in and auditioned for the role. Initially, I, I didn't, I didn't even want the audition because it was just so broad. It was like, it was too, when I got the audition, it was, we're seeing all ethnicities, all people. It's like, oh, there's a hundred people going out for this, this role. And, um, I don't know. I forget what it was, but anyway, I ended up going in I made the, the, the hike to Greenpoint to go. You know, and then I just, I went in and read and with Pete and I stood up and I worked it out and they said, yeah, that's the guy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I knew that guy. I mean, I, 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 I knew who, who my idea of that guy was and I thought I could, you know, I could, could do the right thing by that guy. And, and um, how do you see, so, so working on the show and working with guys like Judd and, and yeah. Pete, but, but I'm thinking particularly Judd here. <laughs> How yeah. do you see? How does someone like that bring out the best in you? As a, as they a just let you do your thing. You know, you, you, the parameters are looser, right? So on a drama, it's more specific. So you know, it's more traditional kind of screen acting in that you have to. Um, that the 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 logistics are very important, right? So the, you you have a mark that you, your line has to land on a certain mark. If there's an action, if you're turning, you're drinking a glass of water. You have to know when you drank that water, and there are. There's continuity in what Judd's doing as well. It's just there's more space to play. And so a lot of that stuff comes in. You improv a lot. You do alts, A-L-T, alts. So you'll run the scene, and then there'll be a part of it that you land on, and then you, you'll you pitch your own stuff. You know, they let you play with your own ideas. So if I have a line, you know, there's one scene where I yell, I'm angry with this couple walking on the sidewalk, and I yell, I hope you have to... I hope you two have kids and you have to deal with all of the associated responsibilities, something like that as a, as a, as an insult. Um, that was just something I yelled while I'm running, while they're running away on the sidewalk and they kept it cause it worked. Um, so that's what he does. He, there's a lot of spontaneity in what he does, which makes it different from other things. You know? And you're coming back on the next season. I would imagine, you know, I just did a panel in New Yorker panel with Pete about all that stuff. And so I've been on the first two seasons. So, I would imagine if it's still set in the village and all, but you know, oh, they, they just let you know. They haven't started airing yet. No, they haven't even started airing the second season yet. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know what they're doing with the third, and I don't know that they've been ordered for a third. I imagine, though, yeah. uh, like, well, I guess everybody, no matter how, one thing that always astonishes me with TV is no matter how much success and no matter how high you are. Yeah, nobody cares. Yeah, you can always After get all. canceled at the last nah, minute. Nah, nah, this whole star bullshit, this is why perception is so much different from reality. If you were running business model comparisons, you know, it's like, and I've worked with, I don't want to name them, but, um, I don't know, you know, are we trying to finance a movie with Renee Zellweger? You know, like some people that were were big stars at certain points. So a star, one, how are we defining it, right? Is it is it just somebody who's really talented? Um, is it somebody who can sell tickets? Because if you're a movie star, meaning your name can really influence whether or not a film gets made, a, a film with a very substantial budget, there's about seven movie stars on the planet, you know, it's like, and then when those, you know, it's, um, I don't know. I mean, it's a star isn't a thing almost. It's like, particularly it, in today's world where I think yeah, there's so right. many, I, I mean, now with, with 8,000 channels and yeah, all these, this different totally. thing. So everybody's got their own favorite little niche and, and yeah. they kind of stick in that, in that ghetto. Yes, you can move more tickets on the road in terms of live gate than you can uh, uh, with a podcast than you can with the average role on a television show. Mm. You know, if you're Seinfeld of Seinfeld and it catches fire, that's a different story. But in general, yeah, you, 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 it's the personal connection. And so now the marketing scenario is, is to be more specific as opposed to more broad. For a while, you know, the television... It's, I think, the rise of in cable, um, whether it's subscription or viewership, has correlated with the rise of, like, Louis runs a very specific, his name is brought up a lot because he's a very influential figure in comedy now, but it's a relatively small viewership in terms of the show, right? It's a groundbreaking show, but... How many viewers does the show have? I don't know. I remember a showrunner telling me it's, it was in the neighborhood of 700,000 then when we were talking about it. I, I don't know. Still, that was like five years ago was the last season of it. Exactly. It's, it's actually, it's actually right. like a, I, I rewatched the series quite a bit, but it's actually been yeah. a long time since there's been a season. It has. It has. And it was never a, it was never a CBS, NBC, you know... Seinfeld yes, was going to get pulled too. I mean, Seinfeld for the first you know season. I mean, in today's environment, in terms of today's business model, you know, Seinfeld would have been yanked in the first season. Yeah, and and you mentioned Freaks and Geeks, Judd Apatow's first. Yeah, TV I never show. saw it, but yeah. that didn't even um, last the entire season. I yeah. think there was there's twelve episodes ordered. And yeah. I think they ran eleven. Right, that's like the show I was on on NBC, where I yeah yeah with Jeff Goldblum. They ordered twelve and we shot nine, something like that. So so. They'll Any, yank it anytime. They'll yank it in the middle of the season. Uh, every star name, what, whatever that means in today's context, um, has been has had their show canceled. Most, if you think of most big, this is funny. Working with um, Bruce Helford, who um, created a uh, what did he create? It was the Lu, Lu, he created the George Lopez show. He ran. He was the showrunner on Roseanne when it was really really hot. Um, and he said it's uh, almost never. Do you, are you able to come back and make another hit? So think of any television star and whether or not they've all had their own development deal after that show went off the air. Everybody from Seinfeld, everybody would, that she's an example of an exception. The the Louise Dreyfus from Seinfeld, Wait, although she had several before Veep, yes, was a hit. Several she canceled. Had several canceled. Yeah. shows. Right. And um and even George Grant. and you're talking about the the most famous show of all time with the exception of a few other enormous shows right so outside of the uh, psychologist character on Cheers um yeah Frazier everybody every actor that you've ever seen on a, from the people from Friends the people from whatever big show they it's almost never have another hit again they're almost never another star in that capacity they don't recreate that ever. Um, with with very very few exceptions, and so that's the environment we're dealing with. And Although so, it's interesting because I guess in movies that's not always the case. Like take a guy like Robert De Niro, yes, where his just raw talent shines. Reinvent in yourself, movie. your book. He's reinvented him. I mean, he's yeah. been able to, to to ride that. You know, well, as, and actually, he's a very comedic actor. Right, that's what I mean. He's been able to do other things, and and he's and he's a really interesting guy to watch, and he is a, a real exception to to the rule, but. Uh, in movies, that's interesting. In movies, they, um, 
it's a different scenario. You're watching an actor, but they ne- they're very rarely able to build a series around a character so you can do it again. And sometimes, whether it's entourage or friends, or a lot of times, you I mean you almost never see them again. Yeah. Let alone in their own series, you know. And then every now and then they'll go on to George Clooney was a guy character, you know. Every now and then there are plenty of exceptions to every rule, but as a rule you better understand something about money, you know, and how to how to hold on to it, how to work with it, what you're going to do with it, because if you think that shit's going to last, think again. I mean, that was always my problem. Like, I had my first yeah. company, I made money, yeah. and lost it all, sure. and then I thought, ugh, that is just yeah. it. Like, I had my one shot, yeah. and yeah. that must have happened to a lot of people, like, you Everybody. Know, particularly these stars. And, and Oh, my God. Robert Downey Jr. is in financial trouble, right? I mean, you hear all these stories. Somebody's always in financial trouble, no matter how much money they've made, right? I mean, you know, you, 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 you have an, uh, an economics mind, you, you know. You can blow anything uh, if, you f- if, if depending on what you do with it or whether or not you're watching it. So, like, so, so, so yeah. this brings me to the, to the book. Yeah. So, so Road Dog, a lot of comics, even comics we haven't heard of or barely even think of, right. actually have enormous success going on the road. And doing, and doing some of them ha- have uh, in, if success you mean money yes they, they'll make um they can make yeah there are guys that make many millions of dollars that you haven't heard of that they play to their own audience i mean i don't know if the average person knows who bill burr is you know who sold out the garden it's like um and that goes for a number of people but um there's a gay big lacy is there are a number of guys out there that do very well um, I'll even I'll even take a know. step down from I, I I shouldn't say step down but I'll go to uh, look at it in a different way from Bill Burr right. who's highly respected among yeah, comedians. comedians but like let's take Carrot Top probably makes millions a year oh yeah absolutely but people don't really think of him as a comedian but certainly he's a comedic act yes and he makes many many yeah I mean and and so you went on the road why'd you go on the road. Oh, to uh, well, to build an hour, to be a real, you know, to be a comedian. So you thought you needed to learn. You ne- you thought you needed. You couldn't just do the clubs here in New York City. I mean, no, I wanted to be a headliner. I wanted to be a headliner, and and also I can make a living for the most part as a headliner. And so then that gives me an option to go out and headline. Um, what? Why? Like being yeah. being a fifteen minute guy at the you know cellar? yeah. There's a vast difference in what you can make money wise. If you want to make money, you have to leave New York City and you have to go headline because that's the only place they're going to pay you. In New York City, that's where all the guys are coming to play. So you you nobody pays much money in New right. York City. And LA is the same way. They're called showcase clubs where you'll have five six acts on at the Comedy Cellar, and it they're all headliners usually, and they're just doing 15 minutes and they get off and somebody else comes on and that's what makes it an interesting place to go a number of new york city clubs also on the upper west side your club yeah stand up new york stand up new york yes uh, how come, when you showcase come, club. when you come back to stand up shoot me an email tell me all when right. i'll come by all right good i'll come um by. so okay so you let's say you're you're one of these guys who's 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 past the cellar which is yeah uh the, the, the best club in new york and uh now you call up your 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 booking agent calls up Syracuse, you got to get an agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he says, Dove's available. Yeah. Uh, they, they then hire you. Or how does it work? Yeah, well, it all depends on the market and whether or not they think they can sell you, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's, sometimes you need to have a number of credits. Sometimes it's, you need to have a bit of a following or something they can sell. So, um, uh, so I, I mean, that's how that kind of works. It's like, this guy's been on this, 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 and this. You know, he's, and, and they know that they'll have a good product when they come there. And so, um, and then some guys had, you know, Mark Maron talks about how he couldn't, you know, really get booked as a headliner out there for whatever region. And he had plenty of credits, but he's a specific kind of act. So he had to really find his people. Um, and we all want that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I was relatively fortunate in that regard. I, you know, I was, I, was, I got, I had a kind of a, I've been headlining for a, a long time and um and i can reliably get x amount of gigs per year i go into you know denver comedy we're good clubs eight clubs all over the country and then um i'll go in and out and so when you're working on an hour when an hour special if you want to sell your your hour special to comedy central whoever the buyer is it's hard to work that stuff out in 15 minute clips at a new york city comedy club 
you know, and so you go out on the because, road. Because you don't have the time. Yeah, So time. the audience is always new, right? Yeah. They're going to the Comedy Cellar because they're tourists in New York. They heard this was the club to go to. Yeah. They wait in line for tickets. They go. Well, it's not about that club, but any club in New York. They're all they're all showcase clubs, meaning you're doing 15-minute right. spots. You're doing 15, and, and, 20 minutes. And so to some extent, the format, it's not, people, and I think people don't fully understand this. It's not like 15 minutes worth of jokes versus 45 minutes worth of jokes. You have to right. spend... Like if you have a, if you have forty five if you have forty minutes, it's an entirely different structure in the sense that you can spend more time building up likability, which buys you the ability to do buys a, you a time, and you got to sustain interest over the course of an hour as opposed to spitting fifteen minutes worth of jokes. It's a different muscle. It's a marathon relative to a sprint. Yeah, so you're not you're not trying to like push out laughs every fifteen different seconds. Different pacing you have often. Time to build a relationship with the audience. You build a rapport, a relationship. Yeah. How do you build that rapport with the audience? Because I think that's important for everything. You know, here's yeah. here's what I find that's interesting. A lot of correlates. So 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 I have done a lot of public speaking for yes. twenty years, and now this past year I've been doing a lot of stand up. Public speaking does not help stand up at all. Like right. there's zero help right. that it's done. Maybe a tiny bit that I'm not aware of, but right. it really doesn't help. Stand up helps public speaking enormously, right? Because there's all these extra, there's like a, an extra 100 skills required to yes. be good at stand up, yes, that, that you're not even really aware of in public speaking until you start doing them, yes. And so, having those 40 minutes allows you to, to kind of build these more subtle skills, I would imagine, it in does. comedy, yeah. that are very difficult, like, like, like ability, yeah. yes, uh, building that rapport. But how do, how do you build the rapport with the audience? It's a good question. I mean, I think initially you got to be it's funny. And once you, you've sold them on the idea that you'll be able to create laughter, they'll give you a little bit of leeway. But if they don't, right, but if they don't like you, they're not going to laugh, even if it's funny. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, like, but you, you, that's a trap too, because likability can impede your voice. If you're trying to be likable, then it's difficult to just be honest. You got to find a way to connect with them. It, it's a, it's an odd, it's a paradoxical thing because my i don't get on stage and i'm not trying to be likable i mean but, i but, want to be open. admitting your faults though admit being fragile right. as you said earlier right that's going to be likable because everyone's going to relate to it at least deep down you're earning it through your own voice but it would be a mistake to go on and just with an idea of i'm going to smile a lot um and compliment people there's something hacky about that, like unless it's your real voice. It's pandering. And so there's a, there's, it's a line. It's, it's all a tightrope. It's all a line in between the thing, you know? I mean, let's, let's look at a, a comic for a second that's, that's very different from you. Someone like an Anthony Jeselnik. So he goes yeah. out there and it's very um, written material, very written jokes. That's his voice, his yeah, thing. And, and his, his, his personality is not even necessarily his stage personality i don't know him well but yeah so so i don't know him at all either yeah. but uh but he but he does and and he's insulting the audience right in, in a lot of parts but because he's kind of smiling and plays that persona it it becomes, don rickles is a good example of mm. somebody who's able to insult 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 and that's why they're coming to see him mm. you know it's like that's his voice he's not trying to be like but he is likable <laughs> and then maybe that's what allows him to sell the insult yeah you have to be able to be likable to sell the insult. Yeah, Louis's not a particularly likable guy. Nobody, Louis doesn't get on stage and then everybody goes, "This guy's really likable," you know. O although, although when he was, he's vulnerable and he's yeah, honest. when he was quote unquote finding his voice, you yeah. know, let's say in the mid oos, he yeah. was going up there and saying, "I'm poor." You know, anyone else here? It's likability. You know, just he earned it because he's just honest. Yeah, and so if vulnerability, if vulnerability, I find it likable and it lets me in, and so. I try to just be honest about how I'm, what's going on. And I end up really vibing and audiences like me and I work all over the country. Um, but I'm not trying to be likable. I'm really just trying, same when I walk into a room, I'm looking to connect, you know? And if that connection serves my likability, that's great. But the objective isn't, I'm going to smile, wear something nice and, uh, and be affable, <laughs> you know? Like that's more of an affectation as opposed to, I, I feel like, yeah. What's, what's, What's the worst experience you've had in terms of not connecting? Because a lot of those people that smile and are really good at being likable aren't the best people. Mm -hmm. For me, the best people, I don't know. I mean, those are, it's tricky because there are so many exceptions. The people that I like to be around are people that are being themselves. And if we find common sort of connections, 
then we can create relationship, you know, and, 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 uh, I have, and, and produce an experience that feels worthy of having as opposed to one that is, um, you know, just more, more surface but affect. Producing an experience that is worth having. And yeah. I think that's where you start to border from, let's say comedy or anything into artistry. Yeah. You're creating an experience with the audience. Yeah. And that is is unique and individual. It's like a canvas yeah. you're painting on. And yeah. so so what does what does that mean? Because that's gonna be unique to every audience. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to just I can imagine a lot of comics just do the road thinking they can get easy laughs in Indianapolis because they yeah. know how to do it in New York. So it's gonna be not necessarily easier to in Indianapolis, degree, yeah. but it's a yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different type of humor. Yeah, the expectations can, can be a bit lower some places, and you can sell hack more easily other places, just like you can sell not good food. And Louis C.K. specifically said those comedians will cap their careers because yeah. that's the f furthest they totally. can get. Yeah, because you're going to be a. There are people who do the road, and then there are road guys. If you want to be a, if you want to be a headliner. You always have to go work through it. Seinfeld's still working the road. He's doing it in a theater. You get there on a private jet or whatever. It's still the fucking road. You still go in. You stay somewhere else. Because you he loves it. Because he's on addicted to it. That's how he feels alive, you yeah. know? And, um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to, yeah, I mean, you got to have some mental horsepower, I think. I don't know anybody who's writing good jokes that doesn't, that isn't, doesn't think reasonably well. And I think that's what caps a lot of people. But, also, it's um, you got to be willing to go to certain places and try to keep, um, if not keep evolving. I don't know. I mean, was prior keep like who keep? That is Woody Allen continuing to evolve. I mean, if that were the case, that you know, his movies at eighty would be better than they were at, at forty two, and they're not. Um, but you think that's depressing, Tim? Death, yeah. That's why he makes movies mm. to keep him from thinking about the, the our inevitable demise. It's a uh, Ernst Becker, the denial of death. That's a big but, influential book. But do you think um, the fact that his movies are not as good now as they yeah. were when he was making Manhattan? Yeah, I don't know. I think he tries not to think about it, and he makes one a year, right? It's like he's still clearly capable of doing. He's still he's still more talented than everybody else on the planet. I mean, um, you you know, with the exception of very few, I would imagine. I mean, and certainly overall, it's like, but yeah, I would imagine, right? I mean, if you made. Annie Hall and crimes and misdemeanors, and then you make something that seems a bit goofy. You know, it's like you can't. Pry. I mean, unless you're out of touch. <laughs> so, so when you go out now, and let's say you don't do as well, yeah, does it get depressing, or are you well, able what to are blow the, it, it off? It would all be about the circumstances. If I'm working some, what what would depress you? Well, uh, it's a good question. If I didn't do the right thing by them, by the audience, if I'm not in it mentally for whatever reason if i took a gig and one time i literally i could i was i was sick and i couldn't get words out at times and fucked up the rhythm and the time and i felt bad i was like oh god i felt bad that people paid for a babysitter to come out and do whatever but um but sometimes there are circumstances i worked i went to do that gig it's called rock on the range it's a big big it's like one of the big national metal festivals it's in ohio on a stadium it's like 40 or 50,000 people. Mm. And I was just working. There was a little venue, like a, a thousand person venue, um, little relative to that um, on the side. It was like a comedy venue. So they'll have different venues. They'll have the main stage where Metallica comes to play and then they'll have the other stages. Um, but I got there the day that Chris Cornell killed himself, right? So they were supposed to headline, Cornell's band, Soundgarden. They were supposed to headline. And so anyway, people end up in this comedy venue and there's a fucking mosh pit 200 feet away and you can hear the music is banging and then i go up and it's like i think i did okay i mean i could barely hear and i had to holler the material and it's like the circumstances were almost impossible i don't feel bad about that as long as i do my best you know if if the people couldn't hear they weren't into it because this guy just killed himself and there's a mosh pit 200 feet away i'm not blaming me right you know so what's the time when you have felt bad what's the worst uh worst um i once i felt bad the next day when i passed out on stage i was in <laughs> south carolina and north carolina one of the carolinas and uh this fucking guy i have never been around uh i haven't really been around pills i'm not very experienced with pills oxy not oxy or um xanax i, I thought they were all painkillers 
And this jerk off, I'd like to find this motherfucker. But this guy, uh, I, I was drinking, I was sipping vodka. And um, anyway, I, I had, I had, when I had a knee surgery, I had some pain. Long story short, there were, um, I had taken like a, I don't know if it was a Valium or whatever one time. And I thought, oh, this feels nice. And the guy tells me he's got these Xanax. And I said, um, oh yeah. And in my mind, I, I should have done some more due diligence. It's my fault ultimately, of course. But the guy clearly knew I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I said, what are they? And he goes, ah, it's just these little bars. He goes, I got Zanny bars, he called them. So I'm sipping on a drink. My throat's jammed up. I have a headache. He goes, you want one of these? And I was like, I don't know. And then he goes, yeah, here, have a bar. Little did I know, a bar is very powerful, apparently. Um, I took the bar, half, less than half, 20 minutes into my act. I, the room began spinning a bit. And then, um, you know, I'm headlining. It was the full room on Saturday night. It must How many minutes were you supposed to do? 50, 50, 55 minutes. And then... Um, I hit the ground at about 20 minutes <laughs> and I blacked out. I didn't get back up. First time ever I'd done that. First time I, you know, that's the first and only time that will ever happen to me, I would imagine. But I didn't know what I had taken the next day. I said that I was so fucking stupid for just taking that because that guy offered it to me without knowing what it was that I was taking. But he was a fan and he was a nice guy. And I assumed, I, I made it clear that I didn't know what they were. And uh, and he still said, oh, sure, it's a good time. <laughs> that kind of thing. Like that you could almost see somebody coming onto a 13-year-old. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm relatively worldly, if nothing else. And the idea that that happened to me, the, the level of naivete kind of I, I experienced and stupidity and irresponsibility i guess admittedly it was under your control and that you shouldn't have taken a substance you didn't know what it was so yeah. whatever but i let the a, audience down i let everybody down so you let them down yeah. and you're disappointed in yourself yeah what's a time when you were trying hard and you were on your best and you right. let the audience down and uh and and, oh, and that's you a didn't good expect question. it it's a good question ah oh, fuck i don't know man i can't think of too many situations at this point in my life like Early on, it's an obstacle course of insecurity and um, feeling horrible and what am I doing with my life and all of that. It's like, um, you know, I mean, I write about it in the book, but when I used to try to get, I was trying to get stage time and it's really difficult to get stage time early on. Nobody wants you until somebody wants you. And then uh, I was, there was a Puerto Rican show that took place after midnight in this sh real shithole comedy room. And um Anyway, it was it was all Puerto Rican. Any, I changed my name to Dove Dominguez just for Tuesday nights, you know, just to get those seven minutes of stage time. And so that kind of thing, you walk away going, this is funny, but weird. And the crowd was drunk and sometimes there were six people in it and it was sucked and you walk away feeling bad, but I didn't. So there was then, but you felt bad for different reasons. You felt depressed and you don't know what's going on and there's no clear line. Nobody gives you a degree. Learning. You're still learning what to do. You're still learning what to do. And so... And I think people yeah. don't realize that, and this is true for every area of life, you got to go through, whether it's one year, five years, yeah. 10 years, there's this whole period where you love yeah. something, but you don't know what to do. Yeah. And the customers or the audience or whoever right. is going to call you on it right. again and again, and you have to push right. through it. You can't give up. Right. That's right. Like, why didn't you give up? I Because I couldn't. I... I, 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 I uh, because it, it it's dangerous to tell people not to i heard you on a podcast talk, talking about sort of what to do with when to pull out of something knowing when to stop doing something and um you made a really good point and it was really articulate and i'm not going to try to recreate it but i felt that i had the talent and i knew it deeply enough that i thought if i can go through this you know, then you contextualize the experience. There are people that it's not f like I've seen people doing whatever. Like there's somebody that's clearly hoping against hope. Weird expression. I don't know the etymology of it where, or where it comes from. But the um, like if you're if you meant if you speak that language, you know, everybody has a story where it it didn't go well many 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 times. That's the learning curve, you know. But um, but if you feel like it makes sense and it's a language that not only 
uh, are you interested in learning to speak, but it's a language that you have an ability to speak, you know, it's going to take a while to pick up the language and the nuances, but, but if you believe that you'll get there, you know, but you got to have that, that belief has to be grounded in something. Otherwise we're sending people out with these fucking overly positive messages. It's like when somebody goes, you can do whatever you want. No, you can't. No, you can't. There are physical limitations. There are mental limitations. I don't care how interested I am in physics. I could not do, I could not be a physicist. I don't, I'm a little dyslexic. I don't have that kind. Math jams me up in certain areas. I, I'm, a, you know, um, but, you know, I mean, physics is hard for anybody, even if you're good at math. And you had, you had some evidence early on that people were laughing at your Yeah, yeah, I, I'm funny. I have talent. I, I know, I, I knew I had talent. Uh, and, and you loved um, it and I liked doing it and it meant something to me beyond loving it it was something I needed to do to reconcile this fucking weird life I lived it, it, I didn't know how else to create uh, meaning that would exceed the meaning I was creating at that time doing that you know, and, and yeah, like I, yeah, and getting laid and all that, that's fun too. But if you're just doing it for that, you're going to burn out. I mean, you can't continue to do it for that, you know, uh, you know, that nightlife. So, so, so what's next for you now? Like now I'm, I'm a, I'm, well I'm a real estate developer right now, uh, in part, I'm a developing. And on Shades of Blue and in Crashing. <clears throat> yeah. But the, the thing about TV shows is that unless you're one or two on the call sheet, meaning unless you have a ton of stuff to do, they don't require that much time. It's this thing of being an actor. It's every actor should be learning something else and doing something else for the most part, because one, you're depending on something that isn't self-deterministic. And two, it doesn't usually require that much time. If you're Matt Damon, you're pretty booked up. If you're almost everybody else, tons of downtime. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, um, but I need to, that in your book, reinventing yourself, meaning whether or not you go and do something else isn't really the point. The idea of always thinking about something new to be engaged in or reinventing whatever it was that you were already doing, you know, it's like, um, so I'll go and I can, I can pitch projects. I'll go out and think of another television idea. Uh, I just had a good pitch that we shot a sizzle reel for, um, and or like a, when you say sizzle reel, is that like a sizzle a reel? reel for a pitch? A sizzle reel is an actual reel that you would watch. It's ten minutes long, roughly, and it and it you get to see a piece of what you're asking the network to produce. So I come in, I say, "Here's my idea. I'm going to make a show about my family doing this, doing that. Here's what I do in the show. I'm a." corporate executive or a garbage man, whatever the fuck you are, you pitch the idea, you show them something that you shot and that communicates some proof of concept and you hope to get an order or at least a, a pilot order out of a network, mm. uh, a distributor. Um, so that's one area. And then you go out on the road and then you do stand up, and then um, I'll go and audition for more television shows and, and, and films if they have them. Although it's funny, there aren't that many auditions. That's why it's a, such a bad business. That's why it, it's a, because the, the numbers are horrendous, um, in terms of the viability of any one project. So you have to, um, mitigate that through, um, optionality. Um, some optionality, meaning you give your, you're trying many things. Yes. And you're not well, just trying TV. Man, not, not just many things like you're throwing shit up against a wall. If you're a really good stand-up and you think you can be a good actor and you're working on that, you believe that you can book roles in a professional capacity and get paid well to do it, then maybe spend some more time approaching auditions seriously or doing some other types of work um, to try to generate that kind of, you know, opportunity or income. You know, it's, you don't start, you know in fields where you know you're not genuinely interested you you're, you're trying to find ways to plumb you know whatever it's like most artists do this right it's like if you look at an actor they want range nobody wants to get locked into playing the same character if they're real actors they're looking to go out and do other stuff you know it's like um within that world or they'll want to try to write something or try to direct something or it's all the same thing you know well, and and your life's an excellent example. You you obviously been, you do stand up. You go on the road and do stand up. Yeah, yeah. You're an actor in a bunch of different projects. 
You're doing yeah. real estate. And I've been all of these things to some degree for 20 years, but I try to reinvent wherever I'm at to some degree in that if I can get job and drama, like I enjoy doing drama. I'd like to do more of that. I mean, I like, and also comedy and also that. So in a business where probability is so low, the more you can do, the more you increase the probability that something works. Particularly if you've spent the year, putting in the years of developing the talent, yeah. the skills, the credits. And the relationship so even with representatives, you know, an right. agent that's going to go and get on the phone and go, I want you to see this guy. He's really good. Mm -hmm. To get somebody with a reputation to do that it can be challenging. So, and of course, your latest development, which is this book, yeah. Road Dog. Right, Road Dog comes out Live October 31st. Live from the road as a stand-up comic, yeah. Dove Davidoff. And yeah. the thing I like about this is just... You know, Colin Quinn called it one of the one of the one of the funniest and most personal books he'd he'd ever read. Um, Ray Liotta has a quote on the back. Well, no, this is just the galley. There's lots of quotes on the on the actual book, the one that comes out. And uh, and this kind of shows what what it's like uh, to go on the road uh, yeah, as a comic yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and the skills that you build and and yeah. uh, interweaving that with your relationships. Yeah, I like. Uh, there's definitely a lot of stories in between relationships that are pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, and it's all related. You know, it's all part of that that milieu. The idea of being on the road is inextricably linked to where you come from personally. You know, yeah. and your experience of the road. Yeah. So I I, I enjoyed it, and uh, I highly recommend people read it. And I am gonna uh, talk to you about coming back to stand up New York. Let's do it. Let's come. Now. Let's come back up. Let's, we'll, we'll, we got we got make Dan some time back so we there. get to talk. Yes, with the great Dan Adam and the one, the only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dove. Yeah, uh, thanks, for James. joining us. Yes. Road Dog. Yes. Road Dog. Thanks. Thanks, James. Next time on the James Altucher Show. In law school, a teacher would be like, oh, so um, what kind of law do you want to practice? And I would say, bold face in the class, I'm going to be a comedian. <laughs> I told this to the Solicitor General of Illinois, all this stuff. And there I kind of felt people pull back. And that's when I felt the shame. Like, what am I really doing? What if this doesn't work out? It's almost like you have to break out of the matrix to kind of say, okay, I just spent 12 years in grade school, four years in college, three years in law school, all for this one goal to become a lawyer. And society approves. Yep. And you broke out of the shackles. There must have been this enormous psychological dissonance at that moment. Well, at first, I kind of felt like a fraud because I would tell people I want to be a comedian, but I knew I sucked. And so, like, you know, I'm telling my parents, I'm telling all these people I'm going to be a comedian, and I was bad. And that's what kind of tortured me more than anything. So why did you decide not to be a lawyer and go for a stand-up comedy? At the end of the day, what I'm pursuing is, like, trying to be my own fan. You know, I just want to say thank you to everyone listening to this. I would say doing a podcast is the activity that I've enjoyed most in these past few years. Please take a moment to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever it is you get your podcasts. It will only take a second, but it will help other people discover the podcast and it will really show people in general that this is a quality show and that it's worth listening to. You can also check out the show notes at jamesaltucher.com slash podcast. And also, if you want to get my blog updates and other updates that I do, sign up for the newsletter at jamesaltucher.com. Thanks again. I really appreciate you guys. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so... How do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.